Thomas will be the standing spot. Thank you for joining us all today. Um, we're excited to have you out here. I know it's a beautiful day, so I'm sorry to pull you away from your gardens after it just, uh, just warmed up after last night. Um, so we'll try to keep this uh, to the point. But um, uh, we have uh, Larry Lample and Dr. Jim Matthews with us here today to talk about the biological collections here uh, at Reedy Creek. So in 2007, I was lucky enough to fly into Charlotte and have an interview with a big panel, and this guy was on the panel, and he hired me. So um, that was the beginning of my career here as a naturalist, and shortly after that, I think it was a couple later that year, so that was March, that the um, biodiversity center was open, or barium was open, so, um, you know, it's been... Close to my heart, I'll close that door in a second. Um, since it's opened, and um, yeah, you're going to hear all about it and the importance of it, and um, there's a lot of key people in this room that have been helping to keep it alive and keep it going. Um, and then I'll turn it over to these incredible beings over here, <laughs> Lenny and Dr. Long. Matthews. Uh, again, thank you all for coming out on, a, on such a nice day, especially after yesterday. Oh, everyone's going to want to be somewhere else today, but to take your time to come here, and this means a lot to us because, you know, we're kind of locked away in the Center for Biodiversity Studies. Um, not a lot of people know what's going on back there, so we really appreciate the opportunity to, you know, have a chance for folks to sit down and be able to tell you about all that we do back there. So thank you for coming for that. Um, I'm just going to talk for a couple seconds before I, I turn it over to the man himself, but... Um, I knew you want to use my words. I'm not one usually for putting a lot of words on the screen. I like pretty pictures, and I certainly have some nice pictures coming out. But before we even jump into the, you know, our collection itself, for those of you that are not familiar with biological collections, what they are, and why they're important, um, this, this was actually from a University of Alabama website. But their words were so good, I'm like, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to read what they wrote, just because um, it's true. You know, bio, biological collections in their simple form our aggregations of our biological collections are organized aggregations of biological specimens. These often vast collections of specimens are routinely used by educators and researchers interested in biological systems. Much of the information scientists understand about the natural world was produced using specimens from biological collections and other types of natural history collections. This includes the distribution, habits, and evolution of species, as well as the response of biological communities to global land use and climate change. Therefore, biological collections are invaluable resources to scientists, both locally and globally. Biological collections also serve as permanent repositories for taxonomically important specimens, such as those used for species descriptions, and historical records of the occurrence, abundance, and variability of species. I mean, I could not have said it better than that. So thank you for um, But that, you know, that really is it. I mean, that these things are super important, and you know, a lot of people can appreciate, you know, the artistic end of it. You know, mounting and preserving, you know, plant specimens. You know, it is an art form, and the same with insect collections too. But the importance that they serve, you know, it's something that a lot of people don't really spend the time to think about. But these things are invaluable resources. And we have one of those on the small local level in the back of Reedy Creek Nature Center. Most people are completely unaware that it's there. So one other quote I had to take here, just because I love this one. Um, this is a picture from that grand opening in 2007 that Laura talked about. But biological collections are a critical part of the nation's science infrastructure and a fundamental resource for understanding the natural world. I mean, these are great quotes. How can I not put this in here? And in the very last one I'm going to read to you, uh, this is from Dr. Emily Meineke from Harvard University Herbarium. And again, I just, you know, in looking for things I wanted to put on, I was finding all these great quotes. I'm like, well, I have to put this up. I have to put this up. But this is the last thing I'm going to, well, there'll be one more thing I'll leave. <laughs> in 200 years, we have no idea what technology will be available and what people will be able to use these specimens for. They contain a wealth of hidden data that we might not even understand exists in our lifetime. So there's a practical element to keeping and preserving them. So the importance is that we don't even know exists yet. And, that is, and it is such a great quote. So all this great stuff, you know, that all these wonderful things and importances of biological collections are true of this collection that's in the back of Reed Creek Nature Center. And the heart of our biological collection, of course, is the Mecklenburg County Herbarium. 
And the person behind our herbarium is Dr. James Matthews. So I am going to talk no more for a little bit. I'm going to hop back in and talk about some of the work that we're doing currently. And of course, besides the herbarium, I want to tie into what's going on in our zoological collection and the work that we're doing you know, related to that. But for the whole story of the barium and how we've gotten from the beginning to where we are now, you're going to hear from the man himself, Dr. Matthews. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you. Oh, who's that handsome man? <laughs> <laughs> that was in my younger days. <laughs> uh, I've been here a long time. I came here in 1964. And... Uh, and if you have a question, just raise your hand and yell it out. I don't have any problems with that. But I would like to welcome you to the Mecklenburg County Herbarium. It used to be called the UNCC Herbarium, but UNCC didn't like it, and so we moved it. <laughs> the county was happy to get it, I think. So I started the plant collection in back in 1964. And if you think about what UNCC was in 1964, it was nothing. We had nothing out there. We had, a, we had some property, and I was the third member of the biology department that was hired. Uh, Dr. Heckenbleitner, some of you may know him, was the chairman of the biology department, but he did no teaching. All he did was work on landscaping the new campus. So we had a botanist and a zoologist, and that was the biology department. From there, we had to then make something out of it. And most of our students were working and coming to school part-time, and we didn't have any dorms or anything like that. People just you know, schedule classes, came when they could, that was the sort of thing. So you didn't have any consistency in building a camaraderie with anything, but you had to have something to pull them together. So uh, <clears throat> I got to thinking about this and I thought, well, I like collecting plants. And I like making herbarium specimens with me. Uh, and that's a little, a little further along in our, in our program, though. So I started collecting herbarium specimens and bringing the, taking the students out into the, on our campus. And so far we've accessioned about 50,000 specimens. And we're going to make that this year. I want to give you some background. Herbarium is just a preserved plant collection, as you can see. We'll let you go back and look at some of them if you would like while you're here. What they do is the specimens document the flora of the area, when they were collected, what they were collected in, that is the habitat and the surrounding species. And they make a, an environmental record of what was there. In Charlotte, that's important. Because a lot of what was there is not there anymore in Charlotte. <clears throat> well, now the interesting thing is that we are in a geological time of warm weather. <clears throat> so we've got more species now than we used to have because they can grow better here. So our job as faculty members of the young institution was to attract and train students in biology. But we had to start from scratch, nothing. We had nothing to, to offer the students. I was the third member of the biology department, as I said. Heckin Blackman was chairman and Carolyn Hampton was a zoologist. So with three people and one of them who was not teaching, you can see the students didn't have, didn't have an awful lot of guidance and direction. But we made it work. Now, let me first, 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 get, get me off there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this is, uh, here's the campus as it existed when I came. Here's Reedy Creek. 
No. What's the creek? Toby. Toby Creek. Yeah. Toby Creek. This is all woods. Here's Highway 49 coming up to here. So we've got all this campus, all this campus, all this campus, all this campus. Woods. So we had we had a place to go. We had a place to go find something. So we started collecting here. And uh, this was the Kennedy Building. This is where the biology department was. Uh, this building right here was where Bonnie Cohn hired me. I was, uh, I had ne never met her before, but my father sent me some paper, newspaper clippings. I was at, excuse me, I was at Western Kentucky at Bowling Green at the time. And my father sent me some uh, paper clippings saying that Charlotte College looks like it's going to be a member of the <coughs> campus of the U of UNC Charlotte of UNC. No, that's kind of interesting. So I started doing some research on it, and so I wrote Bonnie Cohen a letter, and she said, "We need a botanist. Come on down." <laughs> so I came on down, <laughs> and uh, so this is what the campus looked like when when I got there, and we had a lot of field work that we could do from the lowlands and the cleared areas along the creek to the upland areas, all around here. So we started making plant collections on campus. This, this is the, the beginning of that. Now, the, the other aspect then is that, fortunately, ecology was in at that time. People were interested in ecology. Where else can you do better ecology than going out in the field and doing it? <clears throat> so I wanted to document the plants. I had my own personal collection now. Uh, you, you got the next one? Yeah, okay. Is that changed a little. All right, now here's what forced us to move off campus. We didn't have any more campus for us to do anything in. But we had some drainage ditches there and things like this. Uh, but you can see what the campus has done, and that's fine. That's, that's, that's what has to happen to grow. Okay, we need the next one. So we decided that we needed to get off our campus. We collected everything we could. We identified everything. We didn't need to keep repeating the same thing. So we came to here, this is a, this road here is Greer Road. This is the Channel 9 TV Tower. It's got mm -hmm. remain bits of golf to you. Here's the, the support for the TV Tower. This land was just great for collecting. Creeks, old fields, all of this sort of stuff. And it was only five minutes from campus. So, we would come, I, I came over to the Channel 9 TV Tower and I introduced myself and told them what we'd like to do and they said, fine, come on any time, you can park here, don't worry about it, uh, just make yourself at home. I said, fine, I will. <laughs> so I did and we collected all this stuff and this is where our herbarium really took off and started growing because we had creeks and drainages coming down here and all of this land. Now the interesting thing was we didn't ask permission to come on this property. And we knew we wouldn't get permission. This is why I pulled it through the, uh, started through the, the TV tower because they were used to having people coming in and out. So we would come over and park and just explore all this area and collect plants like crazy. I knew that one day it was going to run out, but we, we were blessed in not having it run out too quickly. Now, collecting plants and making herbarium specimens, when you got, got the next one? Okay, this is the first, now, excuse me, in my moving around before I came to Charlotte, I lived in North Carolina, New York, Georgia, so on, so that sort of thing. And I always collected in every place. So 
This is from an Emory University herbarium collection. This is the first specimen we put in the herbarium for UNC Charlie. And it was a Stratoscantia pyudosa. Now, why is that? It's not a, it's a cultivated plant. Well, I had a professor that I worked for who worked on Stratoscantia pyudosa. So I made herbarium specimens of that and brought them with me. So we, that was the first specimen we had for our berry. Next one, Larry. Here's another one, Tradescantia hirsutopolis. It was also from Georgia, granite outcrop species. If you've ever known anything about Georgia, you've got to know a lot of granite outcrops around the Atlanta, Atlanta area. Uh, so then had another one, Tradescantia hirsutopolis. Is that hirsutopolis? Okay. Uh, so that's her pseudocollis, and it's uh, on Mount Arabia, which is a really big outcrop. Bill Murdy was my one that brought me to Atlanta, and I, he and I collected together for quite, quite a few years. Next one, Lenny. Uh, Travis Kenshia, Rosie Owens from Florida. Uh, Collected by Mark Basinger in 2019. Now, Larry Mellish one of my students. And another one of my students is Mark Basinger. Mark Basinger, who got his PhD, is now <coughs> teaching in Eastern North Carolina school. But he's he's just he's out in the woods collecting. Every time they get a break in school, if they got the week off, he's out collecting. <laughs> goes to Florida, wherever he goes. His wife, he and his wife have collected all the way from Maine to Florida. And we've got all of their specimens. So our herbarium is growing in size considerably. And this is one of Mark's collections from uh, 2019. Next one. Now, here is one that I brought with me from New York when I was at Cornell. And I was working on grapes at that particular time. In fact, the revision of the flora of New York, which eventually ended up taking or supplanting the flora of, for, for the grapes in modern times, part of that, part of those data came from the collections that we made while I was at New York, while I was at Cook Cornell. So, Again, 1958 collections, but still sitting in our herbarium today. Next one. Here's a right of Sastavallis, Davidson College. Now, Tom Dangy and I got to be real good friends when I moved here and he was at Davidson. And he was a great collector. And he built a lot of collections, but Davidson had no interest in it whatsoever. None. So when Tom died, we just picked up his herbarium and brought it to Charlotte. So again, we don't, we don't, we don't throw anything away. We just merge and merge and merge. And so this is one of Tom's collections from Iredale County in 1951. Next one. Now, one of my interesting aspects here, and it's, it's here because, uh, my, primarily because I went to Atlanta, where the granitic outcrops are. But we have granitic outcrops in, in uh, North Carolina also. And so, this is a specimen that we collected in 1977 with Matthews and <laughs> and uh, the systematic class from 1977. So Larry and I were out collecting, doing all this sort of stuff, and sharing all of our her herbarium specimens with the other people doing research. And this is the way you get things done. You can't do all the work yourself. You got to lean on other people who are out there doing collecting, and then they have to then supply that. They then provide us with the verification on these names. Dan Bruton was one doing the revision for isoedes, and so he agreed that we had identified Ingomaniae properly, 
and that the Devil Springs Church offered in Tuxedo was a valid specimen. So again, this is all part of the philosophy and the way that we work together to do things in, in the very Next one. Okay, this is me, and I took students out on field trips all the time. And uh, so we would, <laughs> we were at uh, Chimney Rock Park at this point. And uh, got to be good friends with the owner of Chimney Rock Park. And when Lou decided to sell it, and then I was instrumental in getting the state to buy it. So, uh, again, <laughs> got to be there at the right place at the right time. But having the students out there was a great learning experience for them because, you know, you're, they're getting out and seeing where these plants grow and what they do and how they make it. And the emphasis that we have on them is to know what the environment is. Next one. So the botanical collections will build up. <laughs> and you have to do something with them. And so next one. So we process them. This is in the back uh, right back right here in, in this room actually. Uh, that's Catherine, who was the head of the herbarium for quite a few years. And uh, so we have to get all the specimens, get them all organized. What we're getting ready to do here is put them in a freezer for several weeks, and that kills all the insects. And we take them out, and we put them in the herbarium cabinet. Next one tonight. And we put them in the herbarium cabinet and close the door, and we don't get any insects because they are all dead. If you don't kill the insects, they'll eat up everything. They don't know where they are. All they know is that they got food. So uh, here's Charlie, uh, Donna, and me trying to make something out of this tangled mess. Of Material that's going to be at a very investment. But that's part of the game, preparing new for very investment. Next one. Uh, now, being able to move things around is important for us because uh, we get gifts of <laughs> specimens. We're happy to take those. Uh, so you have to be able to move around, get things. Store them around. This is these are all parts for the people who work here in the, in the, uh, in the uh, center. Next one. So getting them into the, the cabinets is important, and they need to be clean when they get in there. You don't want specimens that are uh, have insects on them. They're they're. Genus folders have the genus written on them. Family folder families are written on the name of the, the door of the cabinet. The genera are listed there, and then the species are there. So this is just a uh, picture of what, what a cabinet looks like when it's opened up, and uh, you can go through and look at whatever you want to look at. Next one. <clears throat> now, one of the things we have to do all the time, and I put this one in here because uh, nomenclature changes. Galax doesn't change. It's still a Galax. Uh, when this was collected by Tom Daggy on the buff on the Catawba River, it was called Galax and Phillip. I changed it to Ursulea based on more, uh, on more or later uh, taxonomic studies. So everything has to be documented. You don't put your name on something without putting, putting exactly everything you needed to put on it. 
so somebody else could come along and say, okay, when Matthew screwed this up, this was, this was done in uh, 2022. But everything is done by writing on the sheet itself. You don't leave little notes, you don't put post-it notes on it, or anything like that. Everything is written on the sheet, and then it stays with it all the way down through the history of the trust. Next one. No, I'll just point out, too, one thing on there. The way that was collected by Dr. Daggy was along the bluff of the Catawba River in, I think, was that 1959? 1959. And, you know, what's great about these herbarium specimens is if you were to go back to that place where that plant was collected right now, it would look something like this. So yeah. this you know, it's these the areas, right now. Uh, okay. Lake Norman. So uh, anyway, change, things change. System changes. Body doesn't change. If we do things systematically, that's why it's called plant systematics. We think that we do things systematically, we can walk into any herbarium and look at what they've got there and make sense out of it immediately. We don't have to get somebody to say, say tell me about an herbarium. Now, what's this, what's, what's this genus folder? I don't know what you're talking about. You know, we, everything is, stays the same. Plant names change because we're getting smarter on a lot of things and we're finding that things we lump together at one time are now being split apart because we're learning more about that group. But that's okay. We have a way to put the name on it and keep going. And that's the beauty of the system. Yes. What's the process to get the dirt off the roots? How do you clean, get, clean the plant to get you know, the roots? I wash them. Okay, <laughs> just underwater you just wash them? Yeah, just wash them off. Okay. And uh, then immediately press them while they're wet. And a couple of days later come back and change all your blotters and everything. And then you won't have soggy blotters that you're trying to dry the plant out of. Uh, you've got dry blotters that they can the water out. Do you recycle the water? Like let them dry oh, yeah, just lay them out and let them dry. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Do you ever save the soil sample for any plants? Occasionally we will if we've got an unusual soil type. So if we know that we've got an unusual soil type, we'll save some of that material and put it in, put it in a labeled bottle. But separate from the... Yeah, well, separate from the specimen. Yeah, we can't we can't press bottles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being funny that way. I'm just saying you have to have a separate storage concept. Yes. So if it's organized by genus, but you've got plants from maybe all over the country in the same herbarium, or I'm wondering, like you know, all right, you separate out like Georgia, Florida. All right, we we separate out by family. Okay, that's consistent. We got something in the Aracaceae, the rhododendron, the rhododendrons in the Aracaceae. So you got specimens in the Aracaceae. Now within the Aracaceae, you have the R genus rhododendron. Everything's done alphabetically. So within a family, everything's listed alphabetically by genus. Within the genus, everything's listed alphabetically. By species. Now, within the species, you can have varieties. Some of these are recognized as horticultural varieties, some of these are recognized as taxonomic varieties. But you've got varieties. They are also done alphabetically. Now, Within that whole concept, then if you're interested in the, and I'll show you this when we go on the rear. If you're interested in specimens that grow in a certain area, and you know one genus or one species of that area, then you can get into the herbarium cabinets and make sense out of it. Because, aha, everything's alphabetical. Everything's alphabetical. Everything's alphabetical. 
So it worked beautifully. Now within the, within the alphabet, sometimes you have a little bit of a problem because when we don't, we don't store things numerically by when it was collected. We store it by the county that it state and the county that it grows in. And then when we get to the point of trying to look for what how many varieties do we have, we have these tables. You see what these tables here. We spread things out on tables and we sit down and we think about it and we put our thinking caps on and decide what to do with it. And if we change something, we write it on the herbarium sheet. And we date it, we put our name on it, we write it on the herbarium sheet. Somebody comes in and says, okay, I need to go look at all the things in this genus. I'll just throw those in there because it's something different. You can think about wild rhododendron, cultivated rhododendron. Now, Larry's been, been interested in the cultivated plants, and I have not been interested in that. So, we, when we were collecting everything, we had a, sometimes a separate collection of cultivated material. Generally speaking, the herbarium is using uses, but this is not this is not hard and fast written. The herbarium uses wild specimens. So. We could have a cultivated specimen herbarium, which would be plants collected out of the garden and preserved just like they were preserved if they were collected out of the wild. Generally speaking, we tend to keep these two separate because cultivated specimens can just get overwhelming with people naming, naming new varieties. And taxonomically speaking, herbaria are not really interested in debating the varieties, the horticultural varieties. Now you can look at them and say, oh, well, that's a derivation of certain species. That's fine. But uh, it, it just gets very complicated if you try to split them up ad infinitum. So we kind of draw the line in, we take in the non-cultivated things and put them in the big aquarium. And in our case, we have a botanical collection that has the cultivated plants in it. So that's kind of the process. Any other questions? Yes? What criteria do you use when you're out in the field? Aha, uh -huh, you grab everything. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what you got. You never know what you got. So you take it back into the lab and then sit down and try to identify it. And I've been known to do this. Go back out there and get another specimen because this one's not good enough. You don't want to end up taking all of them. But at the same time, you grab a couple of them, and especially if you have been out right there all day, and you didn't put them into a plastic bag and throw a little bit of water in them. You get them back to the lab and they're all shriveled up, dried up. You can't identify them. So you can make a kind of projection of what I think it is, but you better go back out in the field and collect another specimen to get, get a good one. So we like to bring in fresh stuff. The secret there is to put them in the, in the walk in the refrigerator. Uh, and don't put them in there by just throwing them up on the shelf. They dry up in a refrigerator too. So you put them in a plastic bag, throw a little bit of water in there, and then come use them. And then if you decide you've got one you want to keep, then you press it. Process them as fast as you can. Yeah. <laughs> then press. Like I said, Get them in as fast as you can in a press because that's the best way to preserve them. Uh, anytime you've got water around them like that, 
they're going to start lying. So don't throw things in the bag and come back six months later. <laughs> they gotta work on those now. They won't be the same. So put them, put them in a plastic bag and put them in the refrigerator is temporary. It gets you overnight, over two days. That's about it. Another question. Any other questions? What geographic area do you use? Do I use? Where you collect from what geographic area? Well, when I was in New York, I collected plants around Cornell. Now, that didn't mean that I taught any new thing for the Cornell herbarium. But I got new things for me. And that was my private collection. See, I did get a few things that were new from the fifth from the Finger Lake region that went into the Cornell Herbarium. <laughs> but what we as botanists tend to do is decide where we're gonna live, what we're gonna do, and then make that our home. This is my home. So my collection is here. Now my collection followed me around, memory, to other places, Bowling Green, Kentucky, that sort of thing. And a lot of this, I'll just say this, a lot of where I ended up was determined by plants I wanted to work on. Now think about this. Uh, when I got my PhD, I didn't have a job. So, you know, the, the deans are always going around to the universities and having an open house so that you have the energy. I didn't have a job. I, 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 I never lived in Kentucky. I didn't know anything about it other than what I know, saw on television. Uh, so, my wife and I decided that, well, we'll try Bowling Green. Two years was all it took. <laughs> After two years, we said, let's get out of here. Uh, we're, not, we're not happy. My wife was born and raised in, in Atlanta. <laughs> I was born and raised in Winston-Salem. We were not born and raised in Bowling Green, Kentucky, okay? We've got a lot of friends still in Bowling Green, but as far as doing what I wanted to do, I couldn't do it in Bowling Green. Now the neat thing about it was that when my father started sending me newspaper clippings about Charlotte College, I thought, hey, that's a new land. That's a new environment. That's new all the way around. So uh, as I told you, I was the third member of the biology department, the only botanist around. I had to get out there and make those students interested in botany. And it, you don't do it with plant physiology. Plant physiology is a research type thing. So botany, field botany is the way to get the students interested. So that's why I also fit my needs and my desires, but it also allowed me to do, help the biology department develop. And we ended up getting Reedy Creek Park out of that because we had the data to support it. When the county said, is it worth buying the land? Here's your data. And so we could support that we had the plants to know what was here. This was important to them because they didn't care about the plant. Can we get a park that will fit this, and can you live with that park? We're not going to make ball fields after ball field. It's going to be a nature preserve. And that's what it is. Of course, we've got parking lots and things like this. But basically, Reedy Creek is a nature preserve. And it was because the county had the data they need to have to make that decision. Because of you. <laughs> In spite of me. <laughs> but that's that's the way the process works. And uh, it, so then, of course, I, and I'll show you, I'll show you the beer in a few 
few minutes, but you know, it, it, it just, it's just a series of gamuts. But if you want to open it up and see what's in there, then you can do that. And uh, we have to we have to do it have it that way. Any other questions? We tended to collect in places where we took classes. So a one or two day trip down to Carolina would have been our our uh, collecting area. Yeah, we we were specialized in. We didn't go. We didn't go collect plants in Kansas or no, 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 no. We, our South North Carolina, Carolina was South our area. Uh, two what, Carolinas. Yeah, what we yeah. did is two Carolinas, and in spring break, we always had a field trip in spring break. And we always had a, a place to stay. When you start asking students, oh, I know somebody has got a cabinet. We get a cabinet. We go. We go in there. Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and so. All we did was just find a place to stay. We never camped out. You can't, you can't do plants and camping out very, very well. You can, but it's so. So we would take our class. My class would end up with 10 or 12 students in it. And we would end up loading up the cars and going. Now, out of that came a lot of positive things, like Chimney Rock Park. I got to be good friends with Lou Morris, who was the owner of Chimney Rock Park. Lou had a building on, <coughs> on, on the park. It used to, be a rest, used to be a restaurant. I said, Lou, would you make that into a place we could stay overnight, kind of a cabin? <coughs> Whatever you say, Jim, I don't care. <laughs> so we got the building changed from a deserted restaurant, two bunk houses with space for showers and that sort of stuff. And then in turn, <clears throat> we did the floor of Chimney Rock Park and payment back to Lou for letting us do that. So, you know, it's a balanced thing and, and what you could end up talking to somebody about or making it work or uh, as Larry and Audrey can say, you know, we, if we had a break, we'd go somewhere. It wasn't, it wasn't, my wife would say, where are you going this time? <laughs> and, and come back safely. But uh, she went with us a summer time until we started having kids, and then that, that didn't work. But uh, my son got enough out of that. I don't know if he, you know, Chris Matthews is, in Mecklenburg County Park and Recreation, my son. And he's, he's not a botanist, but he grew up in the woods. <laughs> he decided he didn't want to be a botanist, but he learned a lot about this, and now he's in charge of making sure that the park and rec department does a good job with their park. So it, it comes around full circle. Question. So I noticed on one of the pages, um, the, the location description, a crag on the top of it or something. But yeah. now, years later, do you use geotags instead? We do. We do. We do lat long. Yeah, latitude and longitude is the best we can do because uh, we can't go in and tag everything. But if you're a good enough botanist and you know the habitat of the plant in which you're looking, then you go to those places and look for that habitat, the plant will be, should be there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's how we think. Mm -hmm. So uh, if somebody comes into the aquarium and says, I'm looking for so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so -and, -so, and I say, uh, you can give me a habitat or no, if I don't know the plant. But, you know, with... Uh, 50,000 specimens, we can give you a pretty good shot at what the plant looks like and where it grows. And uh, that's that's the beauty of having an herbarium with 50,000 specimens in it. We aren't quite at 50,000 yet, but we've got enough to do it. We just got to get them mounted and processed. And I'll show you that area too, if you got time. What's your oldest specimen? 
Uh, What's the oldest specimen? 18 something that we got from somewhere. Oh, he's, 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 that looks he like he's on a mission. Do it oh, there we go. Okay, okay, there we go. <laughs> wow. That's the oldest. Doesn't even have a date on it. Oh. 1872. 1872. We got that from the U.S. National Herbarium in Washington. Um, all of us botanists kind of know each other. Stan Shelter said, we went to the museum in Washington, D.C. and Stan and I were at Cornell together. So, you know, everybody tends to kind of relate to each other. I got this specimen that's kind of old. Would you like, yeah, I'd like to have that. Mm -hmm. be the oldest one in the collection. You know, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, yes? Do you have a card catalog or some way um, of knowing what's all in there without going through and touch it, you know? Going through the cabinet. We could, but we don't have the labor to do it. Yeah. What you, what you, the way we would say, I would, if you came in and say, what's your oldest specimen? I can't tell. Uh, now I can. <laughs> <laughs> if you came in and say, I'm working on such and such a genus, okay. and I'm interested in knowing what your oldest specimen is, I can tell you that. Well, that gives you have me to pull it out that, to I find can, out. I'll pull it out yeah. and open the sheets and let you look at the species specimens that we have of that species. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what we do as research botanists. Mm -hmm. We go to generally speaking, we like to go, but sometimes we don't have the ability to go to foreign lands or something like that. But we do cooperate with each other worldwide. If I get a letter that says I'm working on such and such a genus, what do you got in such and such a species? Uh, we'll photograph them, send it back to them. And therefore, they will have a look at the specimen and the data that's on the label. And then if they want to borrow them, we'll loan them to them. And we have a lot of respect between each other. There are some people who are snotty. <laughs> <laughs> Best thing I could say about it. We don't cooperate. But in generally speaking, herbaria people cooperate with each other very, very fairly. Yes? I'm curious about the colors. I noticed that the little color code chart, there's 24 colors there. Obviously, specimens fade. After they've been trust treated, whatever, how do you, how do you accurately describe the original colors, say, of the flower? We oftentimes don't do that. Okay. Uh, this was put on there by the uh, U.S. National Arboretum in Washington, D.C. It was transferred to UNC Charlotte. It was collected in 1872, so that's our oldest specimen. I wasn't born there. <laughs> you didn't collect it. But uh, anyway, we have a few things like this to show, as I'm showing you here. Uh, so, any other questions? I'm curious about what you can tell by looking at your herbarium specimens that you can't tell by looking at a photograph. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> goodness gracious. You can tell how, how branched the hairs are. You can tell how dense the hairs are. You can tell uh, all sorts of things with the, with the press specimen. But you can't do it from the photograph. Uh, you could if you... If you say you're working on a certain genus and hairiness was a dividing factor, then you could set up a way of taking pictures of all the hairs and blowing up the pictures, and then you would know what you're dealing with taxonomically. But if you've only got one specimen, then you don't have a lot of specimens to choose from. 
So you've got to then make a determination about the morphological condition of what you've got in order to put a name on it. Does that make sense? And you can't dissect the flower off of the fur there. Yeah, you can't, you, you can't really tell if you got a dried flower on there and you got a photograph of it, can you count the number of stamens in it? Can you tell me whether, it's a, whether the stigma is style of branched or not? See what I mean? Now, if, you, if you've got something that you need to do on a research basis, if somebody wants to come to me and say, look, I need to look at this flower, because I think it's this, but it may be that, may I, can I have permission to put this in water and warm it up? And then you can lay it out and dissect it and then determine what you need morphologically and press it and dry it again. That's the beauty of having a very you have a lot of yeah, not the whole sheet. You don't you don't soak the whole sheet. You just take something off and you, it, the easy way to do it is put it in a a, a cube, uh, little container and warm it. Not boil it, but warm it a little bit, and then it'll rehydrate. Then you have to carefully take it out, and lay it out, and dissect it under the dissecting scope. When you get through, if you've left anything there, and sometimes you don't, and we have to, we have to make that decision. If we've, only got, if we've only got one flower, we're not going to give you that flower. But if we've got a lot of flowers, we'll take a flower that seems to exhibit what you're looking for. We'll then boil that one up or warm it up and let you, dis you'll end up destroying it. But in, in, in return, we end up getting your data. So it's, you know, it works both ways. Any are, other questions? Are there people that are doing DNA studies from some of the specimens? Do you know? We get an occasional request for DNA studies, mm -hmm. and we always honor it. Whatever they ask for, we always give them. Uh, DNA studies are just really in their infancy using the rare material. But I'm sure it's going to be more widespread. Any other questions? Yes? What happens if um, too many people have looked at it and it's, does it um, disintegrate over time? Do you have to do you get rid of them or do you keep all the little you can repair herbarium specimens fairly easily. Now, if you've got, I'll put it like this, reputation is important. If Jim Matthews has a reputation of borrowing herbarium specimens and returning them would look like they were run through a machine, <laughs> he, won't, he won't get any more specimens. <laughs> So we pretty well know who the good people are and the bad people are in the herbarium world. Even though we're small here, uh, Larry and I have been around a long time. And we know who the good ones are and who the not the good ones are. So we generally can handle that without a problem. Sometimes the herbarium will put restrictions on you and borrow them, saying that you may not remove any piece of this material, which means then you have to live with what's on the sheet. And so you have to move the sheet around to where you can see what you want to see. But that's not that difficult. Either. Then no fly huh? Something no fly <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 